To the people over here, to the people over there, to the people, the people, the people from everywhere, checking out the sound that DJ Lil Beezy is throwing down. Talking about the people who no longer around, the people who because of the fate are buried deep in the ground, the people whose story has yet to be found. It's the story of the people. That's history sound. Oh yeah. That's right, kids. Welcome back for another round of Renaissance Artists. Today we're going to talk about Northern Renaissance and the uh, writers and artists of both. Uh, the term that we're going to use to refer to the Northern Humanist writers is going to be Christian Humanists. So that term is synonymous. Uh, most important thing that you need to understand about this is that it is a religious and educational reform movement. Um, Initially, it's going to be caused uh, because of the uh, humanistic writers of uh, the Italian Renaissance. Um, and we're going to see trade and the wealth of the Italian Renaissance spread to Northern Europe. Uh, a lot of the Northern Renaissance is going to be focused around the Netherlands or the Low Countries, uh, and in particular, the city of Amsterdam. Uh, one of the movements that gives it its Christian feel, or I guess one of the uh, organizations that we're going to find in the, the Low Countries and also in parts of the Holy Roman Empire uh, that would today be referred to as Germany, are going to be known as the, the Brethren, or the Brothers of the Common Life. Uh, you may be familiar with them. They were um, mentioned in chapter 11 when we talked about some of the piety of the lay people because of the uh, weaknesses of the Catholic Church, because they were so busy fighting over power and um, had become very, what's the word, secularized. Um, so the Brethren of the Common Life, one of the people that we talked about was Thomas Kempis, and he, of course, was the author of, what is it? Yes, that's right. He was the author of The Imitation of Christ. Okay, and so these were guys that... Uh, talked about the, or he and the followers, known as the Brethren of the Common Life, uh, talked about a uh, life of devotion, uh, increased piety uh, by more or less uh, imitating the, the, Christ, the, the life of Christ, uh, living a life of solitude and contemplation. Contemplation is silent prayer, uh, and of course the love of God. Okay, so these were uh, people who believed that they should live a more simple life. Uh, and it wasn't just men. It was also they had the sisters of the common life. Sometimes they were lay people. Sometimes they weren't. Uh, as you can see in this picture here, we have some monks who were followers of the brethren of the common life. And there were also some nuns who did that as well. Um, so this movement, because of them, is uh, a reaction to the secularization that's taking place, uh, the material. Um, life that people are becoming obsessed with and so they think it's leading to corruption which it is uh, so they're interested in reform um, thanks to the invention of uh, the printing press by Johann Gutenberg uh, circa 1450 uh, the humanists are able to reach wider off, uh, audiences and um, we're going to see that education is going to spread because of the brethren of the common life they see that that is a part of the reform, um, education and a more uh, devout, more pious life. So they're going to establish a lot of schools. And because of the trend that's already started in the late Middle Ages of the creation of more and more universities, education, uh, an educated middle class, uh, the growth of the middle class because of the increase of trade and um, commerce, more and more people know how to read. And so there's going to be a uh, an audience that's eager to consume a lot of the things that people are writing about. I want to talk a little bit just about how writing has uh, evolved. Um, what you see are two different types of examples of handwriting. The one on the type is uh, kind of predates 800 AD, uh, and it's the one in which the text was copied in all capitalized letters. And uh, what we see in the lower one is what is known as Carolingian minuscule, which was brought uh, to us by Charlemagne uh, in 
He was the Frankish king who attempted to, through an alliance with the Catholic Church, attempted to create a, uh, or recreate the Roman Empire. And uh, what's ironic is he never learned how to read or write, but he was, uh, he saw the value and the importance of an education. So uh, the Carolingian minuscule is where they write minuscule, write in lowercase letters. So that makes the writing process a little bit more efficient and uh, easier to read. So at any rate, the, um, the advent of paper, too, that we've talked about in Chapter 11, um, that was an improvement over uh, vellum, which was used, uh, but because it was dependent upon the skin of animals, uh, they were expensive and uh, books were rare, okay? If you watch uh, this video, uh, Dirty Jobs, uh, but Mike Rowe, you see a little bit of how uh, they make it. It's a short clip, how they make the vellum and uh, how they have to dry it and uh, stretch it out. So it's kind of interesting. But what they would do is uh, press the paper down. They used to use wood cuts um, to make uh, the wood would... Everything would be carved out, um, the picture and all the writing, would, and the printers would press paper down. It would uh, the 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 woodcut would be covered with ink. I mean, similar to the Four Horsemen of the, of, uh, the Apocalypse. We've already seen that. That was used to make a poster um, that be pressed, and they would use these woodcuts until they would wear out. But what you see is movable type. That's the innovation of Johann Gutenberg. Um, and you know different letters can you, there's an infinite number of combinations obviously and so that is what made uh, printing much more inexpensive um, it was invented in a german city called mainz uh, which i've actually visited it's a beautiful little city and uh, you look at this map here 1450 to 1500 um, it's it exploded exploding uh, the number of print shops located so that means a lot of money to be made if you're a printer and also books uh, because of their more readily available that's going to cause um, because of supply uh, the price is going to drop uh, because it's more affordable more and more people are going to uh, own books and um, so uh, the writers the humanistic writers are going to find more and more uh, they can reach more bigger and wider international audience. Some of the things that they printed, you know, calendars, almanacs, how-to books, um, obviously religious books, the Bible, that is going to be translated later on by Martin Luther is going to be the most popular um, book. But um, kings and the church are going to have tremendous influence now because more and more people know how to read, and so they're going to take advantage of that. Um, people are still not terribly uh, educated, and so they're gullible, they're naive, and so it's going to be easy for uh, kings and the church to, you know, create, um, I guess, if they want to move attention away from themselves and create like a scapegoat, um, they can create the boogeyman, and uh, I think the people are going to be very gullible, as I said, because they lack the, um, even though they know how to read, they're not terribly educated, right? And so, um, as I said earlier, um, the focus on the northern humanism or hu uh, northern renaissance is going to be a reform movement, and we're going to call those authors Christian humanists. Um and it's going to be a return to, not the classics for them, uh, although the classics seem to be a good moral guide, they're going to want to almost return to classical Christianity. So the early, early days of the church, uh, Paul of Tarsus and some of the early um, writers, um, St. Augustine of Hippo uh, in the 4th century A.D. is going to be important, so is uh, St. Jerome, because he's responsible for creating, I guess, the Latin Vulgate, which is the version of the Bible. He translated that from Greek. Um, so what they're going to find is that in the, uh, you know, maybe the thousand years in between all of this, the Catholic Church had become very superstitious and one that was um, focused more on um, tradition or 
like various um, performing various rituals. That's the word I was looking for, and getting away from the original dogma. Okay, and we're going to see that in the next chapter. Martin Luther is going to kind of really, really. It's going to come to a head because his view of salvation uh, and the Catholic Church's view of salvation are completely, I mean, they're irreconcilable. That means they can't uh, make up. They can't come to a compromise over that. All right. So uh, they want to change society, these Christian humanists, through education, as I said, and a more devout and um, pious lifestyle. They believe that humans can be improved. Whether they think humans can be perfected, I don't really think so. Um, that is going to be something that people believe during the Enlightenment, that, that mankind is perfectible. They don't necessarily think that, but they certainly are optimistic. All right? So, uh, Desiderius Erasmus um, is going to be the foremost of the Christian humanist writers. He was educated by the Brethren of the Common Life. Um, he was classically trained, and I guess one of his biggest accomplishments was taking St. Jerome's version of the Vulgate Bible and then going back to ancient Greek and then retranslating it into Latin. Um, and it's going to be, you know, they're, he's going to find that there were a number of errors. Uh, so that's, that's a big deal. Um, and it's going to be that, his version, that Martin Luther uses to translate the New Testament into German with. Okay? Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, that there's this, you know, piety and this importance of um, some of the superstitious, superstitious uh, sacraments or rituals of the Catholic Church, he's going to de-emphasize, all right? So his view on the sacraments of uh, transubstantiation is suspect to him. Performing pilgrimages and fasting, especially during Lent, but also on all Fridays, the veneration of the saints, praying to the saints, uh, in, in believing that the relics, the belongings of saints, had some type of miraculous healing powers. Uh, the cult of Mary, he's not going to be a big fan of. Um, Catholics believe Mary is almost the deity herself, and that is one of the major criticisms of Catholicism, is they're, they kind of emphasize that with Mary, but she is... Of course, not a, not a god, but th that is something that they are criticized for. So he wants to de-emphasize that and focus more just on the Bible, what it says in the Bible. And if it's not mentioned in the Bible, don't believe it and don't do it. Okay, um, He's going to write a, a number of books, but the one that he's most famous for is uh, The Praise of Folly. And this is one that is written in 1509, right before Martin Luther um, tags his, um, what do you call it? 95 Theses on the uh, Church Door of uh, Wittenberg in, uh, in Germany, um, Saxony. <clears throat> so just eight, I guess eight years prior, he, he writes this, and, and he's very critical of um, the clergy and uh, some of, like, the, the, the monks or the, uh, the brothers, like the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Um, he's very critical of them because of their... Uh, lack of morality uh, and, you know, drunkenness and taking mistresses because they're breaking their vow of celibacy and not living a very, you know, simple life. They're supposed to take a vow of poverty as well, and many of them aren't. Um, and then the, the, the big one is Pope Julius II, and uh, in our study guide there's a question about that. So he really, really makes fun of them. And, he had visited Rome a couple of times, and he was really disheartened by the level of corruption and the secularism, especially of the Pope. So he it's a very biting satire of of all of those issues, but it's it's mainly against... It's Im immorality in general, but specifically the Catholic Church. Um, so an important quote um, is, Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. So when we talk about the Protestant Reformation, he really had a lot to do with it. But it would be a mistake... Boys and girls, it would be a mistake to think that Erasmus was in, um, was fond of Martin Luther's decision to break from the Catholic Church because he was not. It was not. 
he he wrote against that. So he believed in moderate reform, not radical reform like Martin Luther. All right. One of the contemporaries of Erasmus was Thomas More, and in fact. They were friends of one another. Uh, Thomas More uh, worked. Uh, he was classically trained, and he uh, was a Christian humanist. He was a devout Christian or Catholic male. Um, he worked for the administration or the government of King Henry VIII, who is the son of Henry the Seventh, uh, the second king of the Tudor dynasty, and. Um, he knew Erasmus quite, quite well. They were friends of one another. And when Martin Luther um, begins his break with the Catholic Church, both Thomas More and Henry VIII are quite critical of that uh, and his decision to do so. Uh, but his most famous work is the book called Utopia. Um, it is a book that means no place. Uh, it is a fictitious place. It's supposed to be somewhere located near the New World. And the people who are citizens there live this utopian uh, lifestyle. And um, it is, some people claim, naive, you know, to believe that, that, that such a place can be created. But be that as, as it may, um, it is a society where the people are well-educated and very, um, I guess, industrious. They're hard workers, and they toil um, most of the day, uh, work nine-hour days, and it is a society that is based on cooperation, not uh, competition. Um, <clears throat> it's quite clear in this book that Thomas More thinks private property or personal possessions are the root of vices, uh, and it's what leads to greed, and greed is the source, according to Thomas More, of all of mankind's sins, including war. So, uh, you know, man begins to covet what his neighbors have. Countries covet what their neighboring countries have, and that's why violence and war and theft and all these terrible things happen in society. So it's due to property. So if property was not did not exist, private property, then evil would be, um, would have, would have nowhere to take hold, and so it's it's a novel and logical approach. So this community is um, is perfect as a result of it. Okay, so some would say, "Wow, that sounds like like in a couple of hundred years the writings of socialists or even Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto." Absolutely, absolutely, they're they're, they're they certainly are. Um, some themes that overlap with one another. Um, his devotion to the Catholic Church is one that's going to get him into trouble because when, I'm jumping ahead here, but hopefully you know something a little bit about this, Henry VIII breaks away from the Catholic Church and when he breaks, because he wants a um, divorce, he wants his marriage to his first wife, Ka uh, Catherine of Aragon, annulled because he needs a male heir um, to avoid a crisis of secession. And um, the Pope is unwilling to do so. We'll get into why the Pope doesn't do so. It's against the rules, but there's another more important reason. Um, so, at any rate, when he decides to break from the Catholic Church, Thomas More doesn't approve of that. Well, that's not a big deal. But when Henry VIII requires all of his, you know, employees and those, and I would think a lot of the nobles... Um, House of Lords, House of Commons, everybody is required to take an oath of loyalty to him, basically um, acknowledging something that he passed called the Act of Supremacy. The Act of Supremacy said that the Pope is no longer the head of the Catholic Ch the Church of England, it is the monarch. And Henry VIII is the head of the Church of England, and you have to you know, take an oath of loyalty. Uh, because of his devotion, uh, to the Catholic Church, he refused. Thomas More refused, and although he was a close personal friend of the king, the king could not allow this to stand, and so he was tried and found guilty of treason, and he was beheaded. That means he was executed, kids. Okay, uh, let's see. What else? Yeah, it's a very interesting book. 
Um, there's it. Nope, I'm not going to tell you about that. Never mind. Moving on. Um, Northern Renaissance artists. Um, one of the early ones is Jan Van Eck, um, who was the first to experiment and more or less perfect the use of oil-based paints. Oil-based paints allow us to mix colors. Oil-based paints um, create more realist, uh, more more realism because of the colors. And uh, he also his other innovation is the use of a single-haired brush, which allows you to um, do a number of things: uh, hair and fur. So, again, another feature or another added uh, realistic innovation. All right. So his two most um, famous paintings are the Arnolfini wedding uh, or the and the Ghent altarpiece, which I'm not going to uh, require you to know, but um, altarpieces were panels um, frequently painted uh, on the altar of churches and there would be two or three panels. So the painting of wood panels was more of a medieval um, technique or medieval I mean, it was just common. It was just a, a common type of um, commission for an artist. But um, he was in the in the north. That that trend kind of continued. But uh, Arnold Feeney wedding is the one that's featured here. This is my favorite um, Renaissance painting. What's my favorite piece of artwork of all time? What is it? That's right, kids. I'm so proud of you. The Pieta by Michelangelo. All right, so some of the things we want to look at. So what, what we know is that this is a wedding. This is taking place in their apartment, in their home. Uh, this guy is a, um, a merchant of some sort uh, in, the, in the north. He's well off, and you can tell by his clothing he's wearing a fur robe. Um, and it was, gosh, this, was, this predates... Okay, so when the Catholic Church responds to the Protestant Reformation with um, the Council of Trent, one of the, I guess, reforms that they put in place is that people have to be married by a priest in, inside of a church. This was not the, um, this wasn't yet, this predates that. So to get married, you, all you needed was a witness, I think two witnesses. And so to, if this was not necessarily did not have to be performed by a priest. Um, so at any rate, this painting is of these two on their wedding day. This is their exchanging their wedding vows. Um, and some people think that this is a scandalous piece because if you look at the woman, oh, is she pregnant? Oh, no. Is she pregnant? Is this, is this what they call a shotgun wedding? Uh, no, it's not. She's not pregnant. It's just... Um, she has a very long gown, and she is holding it up. That's all. Um, but there's a lot of things going on in this painting, and I have some other slides just to show you. The dog here is in here, their little pet, Fido, right? That's his name, Fido, right? What does Fido stand for? Fido stands for fidelity, and fidelity is something that you have to, you know, it's like a, a vow, fidelity. That's a vow that not many people... Um, follow anymore it's <laughs> it's you'll remain faithful to your spouse you won't cheat on your spouse um so the dog there is symbolic of this so this painting is very rich with um with those symbols up at the top here you see a chandelier and only one of the candles of the chandelier is uh is lit why well, the other ones blew out. Well, why? I don't know why, but the one that is still lit is perhaps symbolic of the presence of God. Yeah. Um, there are some uh, some oranges that are on the uh, windowsill here and right here. That could be a symbol of, well, when you get married, you hope that the woman is fertile. Uh, and that she can have children, and so it is a symbol of fertility, okay? And let's see, what else do we want to look at? Um, let me pull out here, and then go to 
the next slide here. All right, so the most important, most amazing and fascinating part of this is the mirror. The painting, um, he has painted his reflection or the reflection of this couple in the mirror. And if you go and zoom in even closer, some people think that, oh my gosh, he's painted himself in there. This is a self-portrait. Oh, how novel. No, it's not. It, it's the witness. It's the witness uh, or two. I can't. There's a guy in blue and then some little, I don't know, somebody in red. I don't know what's going on there. But anyway, that's amazing. All right, that is the most ingenious uh, forms of linear perspective that I've seen. Okay, and also the way in which the mirror is shaped. It's got a convex uh, shape to it, so everything is rounded. So that's quite impressive. Very skilled. Uh, and then what do you see here? You see what are known as the Stations of the Cross. Okay, so this is definitely a religious piece. All right. The presence of God, you know, can't escape it. He's there. He's with them. Even though it's not in a, you know, in a church, the presence of God is there. Because Catholics believe uh, marriage is one of the sacraments. It's a sacrament that you can't, can't get a divorce. Okay, so it's, it's serious. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Stations of the Cross, but that's what, when Jesus was crucified, all the things, you know, he was whipped. He carried the cross. He fell three times. He was helped. He met women along the, you know, and they, they, um, they wiped his face, and um, apparently it was called a shroud of Turin. Like he, miraculously, his face was uh, imprinted. You know, the blood and the sweat and dirt left an imprint of his face on this shroud. Well, they found through carbon dating that it was a fraud. It's a shame. This means something. I forget though. Don't worry about it. Oh, this is cool. All right, here above this mirror, it says Jan van Eck was here. And he dated it, 1438, the date of the painting. So he signed his own painting. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. I like it. Very clever. All right, next. Uh, Albert Durer, we're familiar with him because of the uh, woodcut of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. But again, woodcut means this is It's going to have ink uh, rolled over the top of it. And then it's going to be... Um, this is a, a, a print, though, but it, it was carved by hand. He, so the wooden, to give this imprint, everything had to be carved. So uh, Albert Durer was very, very skilled uh, in that um, medium. And, uh, you know, we know that this has to do with Revelations. Um, this is 15, or no, 14, 1498, I think. I think, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about this because we've already talked about it. Um, but his other ones uh, that he's famous for are known for his self-portrait. And he did three self-portraits. Uh, I'm just going to show you one. It's the last of the three. And then another one called the Adoration of the Magi. I'll talk about that. All right, so this is um, his self-portrait. And everybody's like, wow, this is amazing. Holy cow. Well, you see the single hair brush because of the fur collar. Uh, he de he definitely looks uh, intense. He's got this, you know, gaze that's penetrating. Uh, some people say that it's similar to the Mona Lisa because of the eyes. The eyes just draw you in and they freak you out. Well, I don't know about that, but he's definitely uh, intense. And his face is super serious. It's like, what do we say? Solemn. The face is solemn. That's right. Um... He's got pretty hair, too. I'll tell you that. Those are some dreads or some curls. I don't know. But some people are like, oh, my gosh, this is like reminiscent of a, like a portrait of Jesus. Uh, yeah, maybe. A lot, of, a lot of portraits of Jesus looking right back at you, you know, for the effect. Um, it was very uncommon for uh, artists to do portraits like this. Um, but he did, and he's looking straight at you. Um, and he wrote his name over here. And then he signed it over here. And we're familiar with this A and a little D below it. So 1500 was the year. He was at the age. It says, yeah, Albert Durer made this painting at the age of uh, 28. So he's just, uh, you know, he's old compared to you, but he's a pup compared to me. Um, let's see what else I want to tell you about that piece. 
nothing. All right. The Adoration of the Magi, uh, the wise, the wise men. Here's Mary, and there is Jesus. So this is considered what? That's right. Very good. Good job, Blake. It's a Madonna. Um, so the three wise men have um, traveled far. Uh, what to Bethlehem? To visit and give gifts, and that's exactly what they're doing. Um, what's interesting is that Joseph is not present. Where is he? Oh, maybe he's milking the cows. Uh, that's a bull. All right, change the subject. What about um, what's going on a bit in the background? Like everything's all blown up and destroyed. Everything's in. Ruins, R-U-I-N. It's a ruin. Hmm. What could that mean? Is there some symbolism here, kids? Yes. Yes, there is. There is very much some symbolism. These are ruins. What could that mean? Perhaps before Jesus returned? Or Jesus... Not returned. He hasn't returned yet. Uh, before Jesus came... That man was, mankind was doomed. Uh, that the, the, the state of things, um, humanity was in a state of ruins. And without Christ, we are in ruins. Perhaps that's what the artist is saying. Again, the Northern Renaissance has definitely got a very Christian flair to it. Non-secular, if you will. Oh, look at those archways. Archways. Hmm. Success. All right, here's another guy, Peter Bruger, uh, Bruegel, excuse me, Bruegel the Elder. He's got, there's a younger, um, I think it's his son, and uh, we're not too worried about him, but he's a Flemish painter. Where's Flem Flanders? Flanders is in northeastern uh, France. Remember, that's where, that was part of the problem with the, what was it, the wool, uh, weavers that kind of triggered the Hundred Years' War. Okay, so the peasant wedding. Uh, this is kind of a cool painting. Um, what we see that's unique about this is that the people, the subjects, they're nobody. They're not important. They're common people. You don't frequently do this because the you know these guys were commissioned to paint um, pictures of important people, and these guys are important. These are all very common people. All right. So this is a wedding. Um, here's the uh, the bride. She's sitting under this green, uh, you know, uh, tapestry or just something put up on the wall. I don't know really what's going on there. Uh, I don't know where her husband is, uh, but she's just sitting there. Everybody else is eating. She's just got to sit and wait and um, take her time. They're handing out the uh, dinner. I guess, what do we have? Porridge? Peach porridge. Pea porridge hot. He porridge cold. Peas porridge in the pot. Nine days old. Yep. Uh, and then they got some bread here and some uh, utensils to cut them with. This guy is drinking some beer. Uh, these guys are playing some musical instruments. This guy is refilling. Oh, wow. That's a lot of beer. All right. They're going through a lot. And this kid, hopefully he's not drinking beer. Uh, and then over here, this guy is kind of important he's dressed differently he is dressed like nobility so he is probably the landlord so these are all commoners this is inside of a village you know feudal village type and they've been in, in the, you know the family was smart enough to invite him and he's involved in the deep conversation with this guy with a cloak on who is this guy with a cloak on he's probably some kind of friar or something trying to talk him out of his money i guess but yeah, it's just an ordinary scene. So this piece, although it's Renaissance to me, it's reminiscent. Um, it's it's kind of given us insight into a genre of artwork that we're not going to see for a while. But it's called realism. Yeah, um, a, a type of artwork that just focuses on the toil of everyday workers, people who working in the factories, people kind of during the Industrial Revolution when, you know. It wasn't necessarily the greatest time to be somebody who worked in a factory. You see a lot of uh, 
and, and you know, it was hard life for the farm. Everybody, you know, just focused realism. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Millet, um, whose most famous painting is called The Gleaners, which we'll talk about at some point. Here's his other, is The Triumph of Death. Um, is it surprising that he's known for painting um, pictures that have a lot of different people in it? Yes. And they all look distinct, so remember that is a Renaissance feature when they look distinct. Um, yeah, so I have no idea what's going on here. This is like crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, the skeletons are killing everybody. They're killing me kind and it's a very chaotic and it's just a disturbing painting it's going to give me nightmares so i better hurry up um it's getting late don't kids if it's late at night when you're watching this don't turn it off i don't want you having nightmares because there's coffins and dead bodies and look at this dog he's like eating this lady's face off right down here look at her f oh my gosh that's just terrible um this guy, what is going on? He's been killed by the Grim Reaper. Oh, no. No, that's the... Okay, that's the skeleton carrying his body. All right, never mind. Uh, there's all kinds of just wickedness and sinful behavior taking place here. Look at these guys. Isn't this interesting? These little wheels up on these posts. Yeah, that's... um. They, they impaled people on it. Yeah, so they're on top. They're just chilling. Dead, too. Uh, yeah, that, look at that, and cutting heads off, and here comes a whole bunch more of them coming in through the tunnel, yep, and they got this guy, and they're throwing him overboard, all these guys are, where's his head, oh, it's been cut off, this guy has got a nice, interesting collection going on of skulls, that's fun, and the horse needs to eat, he's hungry too, probably going to eat that woman right there, I would if I was him. No, I wouldn't do that. Uh, let's see, what else do we... Yeah, this guy, I think he's the last man standing. Oh, no. What's this guy doing? He is playing a song. Not sure. Not sure that's a good time to be playing a song. You should probably pick up a sword and fight. All right. Um, yeah, this guy is pretty much doomed. Um, this guy's still fighting, so that's nice. Look at these guys over here. These are the, the, the armies of the uh, soldiers, or the dead soldiers. Um, what are they carrying? What is that? What are their shields? <gasps> Those are the lids of coffins. How do I know? Because there's a cross on them. Yep. So that's crazy. And what else do we see? Look at that guy. <gasps> Ooh, <laughs> he's getting pulled in. Oh. That sucks. All right, let's back out. I want to look at these other slides close up because it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. That dog is eating her face. Or is he licking her? I don't know. And... Oh, look at that guy. They're hiding. Very clever. Very clever. Stay underneath the wagon. They won't see you at all. Oh, look, here's the king. He's getting tore up. Oh, and they're taking his gold, too. Yeah. I don't know. What does this painting mean? I think it means that the artist is crazy. That's what I think. Yeah, look at that poor guy up there. And then that guy. And then that. <laughs> if this would give me nightmares right here, getting pulled into the, ooh, into the dark. Yeah, that's not fun at all. And then one more. Um, this guy's bummed out because he doesn't get to kill anyone because he's in the back. He wants to be up front. Oh, he wants to be up front with everybody else so he can do some killing. This is very nice. The, <laughs> these two guys are digging up graves because they want their buddies to join them. So, the triumph of death. Yep. All right. Hey, under 40 minutes. Awesome. Have a great weekend, kids. See you on Monday.